What are the necessary things that make a family? Is a family a house it lives in? Well, no, not really. I've seen families lose their home, and yet they're still a family. Is, is a family the things that they do together? Well, again, no, not really. I, I've seen families age together to the point where they can no longer do the activities they used to do, and still they are a family. Is a family shared interests? Well, again, not quite. I have seen families with diverse interests, and yet they're still a unified family. Perhaps the best way to think about it is like this. A family is only as strong as its relational bonds. I have seen families flourish without a home because their bonds of love were deep. And I have also seen families with a home wither away because their bonds of love grew shallow. I think this is important as we think about the effects of 2020 on us as a church community. We are not a building. We are not events. We are not even our shared interests. A church is only as strong as its relational bonds. And the Apostle Paul knew this. And so he writes about this in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. He says, And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. As we worship together today, let's remember that we are strong because in Jesus we love each other and are committed to our church family. The Jesus we have in common is stronger and deeper than anything that might divide us.
Unless you come, will you meet me here again? Is all I want, is all you are, will you meet me What if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better? Have you ever been sidetracked by those videos of unlikely animal pairings? Right? The crazy videos of those, those animal odd couples that surprise us because they're on the opposite ends of the friend spectrum, yet somehow they've developed some sort of affection for each other. It's the stories of the dog that befriends the lion, uh, the rhino who, who's made friends with the sheep, or, or the, the cat that is friends with all of these baby ducklings. And somehow they all seem to get along, right? The, these animal odd couples baffle us sometimes. But people display a similar kind of affection toward each other as well. It's the affection that a child shows to the crusty old mailman who delivers their mail every day. And, he, and that child just lights up with delight as this mailman approaches. Yet this mailman doesn't even give the child the time of day in that moment. Yet this same child will, will repel the affections of somebody who just wants to be friends in that moment. Right? It's that adult who comes into the room and just wants to win the affection of the child, but the child will cower away and hide. The difference between the mailman and the stranger is that the mailman has become familiar to the child. It doesn't matter that the, the mailman doesn't give the child the time of day. The child is excited because this is part of their routine. This is part of the connection that's been created because this is what happens every single day. The child is excited about the mailman because the mailman has become part of the child's little world, creating a connection with the child, something that a stranger doesn't have. See, connection to what's familiar creates a bond of affection for us. If you're a note taker, it's a good time to pull open the Mission Church app and follow along. But connection to what's familiar creates a bond of affection for us. Our affection toward each other grows through our connection to each other. This is seen uh, between parents and a child. It, it's that imprinting process that happens at, at birth as, as a mother gets connected to her child. And we see this in our pets, right? Uh, a dog will wag its tail at a familiar guest, but it'll bark at the door when there's a stranger. Right? It's that connection to what's familiar. The camp director of the summer camp I used to work at had two kids that were along for the ride all summer. He had two kids, Keegan, uh, his oldest daughter, and Curtis, who was about four when we worked at the camp. And Curtis was a typical rambunctious little boy, ran around the camp, acted like he owned the place, even though he was four, he'd bark out orders every now and then. Uh, but Curtis was rough and tumble, except for one item that he carried with him constantly. It, it was his blanket. His blanket was, was his security, it was his safety, it was what was familiar to him. He couldn't take his naps or go to bed without his blanket. It rarely got washed because he would never let it go. And if he didn't have it, it was, 
There was usually tears involved. It was very much a a Linus kind of situation. Well, his mom got tired of giving him a brand new blanket that she kind of kept in stock, and she was worried that she wouldn't be able to find him. So she got the idea of cutting the blanket into little squares because as he would drag this thing through the camp, through the dirt, through the mud, getting it hung up on trees, it would become tattered and torn. And so she cut it up into little squares, and she would give him a square every week, and he would basically carry it around until it disintegrated. And then she would present him with a fresh, new square. You see, he had built an affection toward this, uh, this, this blanket that provided him security and safety. As a kid, Curtis had an affection toward that blanket because it represented something that was familiar. See, we can all identify with this. Hopefully, you're not still carrying around a blanket that might be a little bit strange, uh, but, but you, we've all got something in our life that we can identify a connection with, an article of clothing that's important to us, right? It's, it's comfortable. It fits just right. You have a ton of memories associated with this one piece of clothing, and you're going to keep it until it disintegrates. Now, this piece of clothing isn't something that you would wear to a wedding. This piece of clothing isn't something that you would wear to the office on a regular basis or out to, to a meal, but I bet it's the first thing you put on when you get home and want to get comfy and want to enjoy a little bit of couch time. Right? Our affection grows to, to not only objects, but hopefully, more importantly, to people. When that bond is created over what is familiar, over, over what is built up over time. And this is a, a basic level of affection. This base love of affection is known as storge. And this is going to be our, our focus for this morning as we begin to understand one of the most basic levels of love that God has created for us. Let's pray as we dive in. Almighty God, we thank you for this time together, Lord, as we, as we better understand what it means to love and be loved, Lord. I pray that you would move and open our hearts as we open your word together. We thank you for this time together, Father. It's in your son's name that we pray these things. Amen. Well, we're starting a brand new series this morning, and we're calling it The Four Loves. In the Greek, there are, are four kinds of loves that are, that are described at a very basic human level. Uh, there's storge, philia, eros, and agape. And this morning, we're going to focus on this love known as storge. See, love is a very basic human emotion, but at its core, it extends to the, the deepest parts of our relationship, not only with each other, but our relationship with God. And as we begin to wrestle with this quite complex idea of loving and being loved, what we begin to discover is that we're created to have a connection. See, love has levels and dimensions that are necessary for our wholeness. We don't just love or not love. There's, there's, there's complexity to love. There's degrees of love. Like a multi-course meal, God does not just give us one experience of love. He gives us multi-faceted experiences of love. That th- things that will allow us to deepen our ability to love and be loved. As we will discover, affection is the first course of love. It's the the first love that many people experience right out of the womb. We've all heard the expression, he's got a face only a mother could love. It's such a heartwarming and endearing kind of message and phrase. But the sentiment gets to a type of love that is foundational for each and every one of us. You see, at its core, this kind of statement gets at a very basic level of love. This is This is what affection is. This is what storge is. This this is a a human's first experience with love. It's the love of a mother toward a child. Storge is a natural or instinctual affection. There's a very natural connection that gets created between a mother and a child. right? And this is also known as kind of a family love. Most commonly, this, this is the love that we, we see between a, a child and parents. This is also the kind of love that exists between siblings, brothers and sisters, brothers and brothers. And this is the kind of love that we experience on a family level. But ex, it extends beyond the family. We can experience the same kind of affection with others in our life and in our world. Storge, affection, is the common thread of how we love others. 
Our first experience with affection starts when we're born, and it's carried all the way through uh, our loving experiences. This kind of affection grows as we develop lasting and meaningful relationships with other people. We don't see the Greek term storge uh, appear in Scripture. We see examples of this kind of love between Noah and his family, between Jacob and his sons. We see this between Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But the opposite of storge, a storgos, is something that we see in the New Testament a couple of times. A storgos means devoid of affection. In speaking about the godlessness in the last days, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.3, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control. This is what people will be like in the last days, lacking any kind of affection or care or concern for others. Romans 1.31, Paul describes the unrighteous as foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. There's no care or concern for others. It's clear that lacking affection, lacking storge, is is obviously a sign of our brokenness. And more importantly, it's a sign of our need for Jesus. Someone to teach us love in in a very basic and better way. Every single one of us needs to develop these kinds of connections in our faith if we desire to grow in our faith. See, these kinds of caring relationships challenge us to go deeper in our faith. In describing the the marks of a true follower, Paul doesn't just say we we should have love toward each other. He says that we should have a brotherly affection. In Romans chapter 12, verse 10, Paul says, Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Paul is not encouraging a, a sappy kind of you know, love in this case. He's drawing us to a place that takes us somewhere beyond just liking someone, right? I, I can greet you on Sunday, I, I can give you a pat on the back, and I can tell others uh, that I know you from a distance. I, I can say, I, I know that person. You know, I can, I can even encourage you to have a good week but it becomes something entirely different to me to care about you, to be truly invested in your life, to know what's happening in your life, to know what you're struggling with. See, that's the difference between, between just knowing, knowing somebody and actually knowing something about them. I think we're all comfortable knowing somebody. We're comfortable being able to point that person out, maybe even being able to identify their car on the road, but do we really know them? Do we really care about them? See, believers are encouraged to love with a genuine regard for others. What that means is that we would we'd actually care about them. We would care to get to know them, to not just have it be this surface level thing, but to actually go deeper. What it means is that, is that we must get to a place in our relationships that we truly care about the person. To have regard for someone is to show honor toward them, to care about them. It's caring if someone is around. It's missing them if they're, if they're not there and looking forward to seeing them again next time. This kind of care for others is a willingness to share a person's burdens and struggles and at the same time be able to share their blessings, to be excited for the things that, that are, they're becoming victorious in, about in their life. And culture says that we don't need these kinds of relationships. Cultures, culture says that, that we, we should really shut people out, that we should be private, that we, we really shouldn't let people in. This is actually the opposite of what we need. See, we all need people in our life, people that we can be comfortable around, people that can challenge our thinking, people, people that know us, and people that can, can care about whether or not we're around. I've been blessed to have men in my life that I can truly say I have a deep affection for. And I not, not, may not see them for years. I may not be in the same uh, zip code as they are, but we can always pick up right where things left off. These are men that I went to high school with. I stood up in their weddings. They stood up in mine. I've seen their kids get married. Uh, I've prayed, for their, played, prayed with them through sickness, shared personal struggles with them, and, and farted and belched our way through many long car rides. 
But these are relationships uh, that have developed over time. As we've, as we've discovered things about each other, as we've taken time to, to invest in each other, to go beyond the surface of just saying, I know that person. See, we're, we're not bound by time or zip code. We have a genuine regard for one another, and these guys won't let me get away with surface-level answers about life. See, every believer needs people of substance in their life, people of integrity who, who will encourage you to be a person of integrity. Conversely, you need people in your life that you're encouraging in the same way. And people that you're encouraging to deepen their faith, people you're encouraging to be a better husband, a better wife, to be a better employee. We all need people in our life like this, people who truly care about us and people that you can truly care about. And this is broader than our friendships. Uh, the, these are the, the broader relationships that we develop with people over time. Next week, we're going we're gonna to delve more deeply in what it, what it means to have deep, abiding friendships. But, but this is a broader level kind of, kind of uh, uh, relationship with other people that we would have people in our life that are looking out for us and caring about us. The common thread for these kinds of relationships is that we are all part of God's loving family. 1 John 3.1, uh, it says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we, would, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. As children of God, we are are brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a a common spiritual bond because we are followers of Jesus. We are brothers and sisters in the faith. This truth should not be taken lightly. This truth is what provides the common thread for all of us to be able to do life together. It doesn't matter what our background is. Maybe, maybe we've got different work experiences, different life experiences. Maybe we're at a different stage in our life. But the common thread in all of those is a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's not that we, we have the same interest in a sports team or the same uh, interest in our hobbies. The common thread is Jesus. And yet we can be so quick to condemn each other rather than having compassion for each other. I get so grieved to see brothers and sisters treat each other harshly. See, as a, as a parent, I don't like it when my, my kids argue. I want to I see my kids get along. And I know it's part of being a kid. I know it's part of being broken people that we bump into each other and stuff spills out. But as a parent, I don't want my kids to just get along. I, see, I want them to care about each other. And I want them to care for each other, that they would stop each other from doing something dangerous, that they they would care enough about each other uh, to to be able to to direct them on on wise decisions to make. See, our Heavenly Father wants us to care about and to care for each other. That we wouldn't just care about somebody, that we we would actually step out and demonstrate that, that care with our actions. That we would look for ways to outdo each other in showing honor, that we would genuinely care for one another. Friends, you are wired up to need this kind of care, and you're wired up also to give this kind of care to others. See, storge is something that we, we need to receive, but it's also something that we need to give. It, it's something that is part of your hard wiring as a follower of Jesus. We need to experience this kind of affection in our life. To be on the receiving end of this kind of love is critical, but also to be on the giving side of this love. Sometimes when people struggle to show care for others, they end up displacing that care towards something else other than human people. There's there's a fear that the care that we extend won't be received well. And so instead of dispensing that care on others, we dispense that care to our pets, or we dispense that care to the, the, the personal objects we have in our life. You see, having a genuine regard for the ongoing faith of a brother or sister in Christ is one of the best expressions of care that we can give to others. In our faith relationships, we complicate this very basic level of care by making our faith private. 
right? We, we think of our faith as something that we do privately on our own, right? It's, it's my time with God. It is, going to church is, is my time to, to be in worship with others. We believe the lie that my faith is, is something I do on my own. It's just between me and God. Why do we, why do we see a brother or sister who's struggling, Right? They, they, they haven't been to church in a while, and we recognize that. The Holy Spirit prompts us in, a, in, a, in, in an amazing way where we go, I haven't seen this person in a while, and that comes to mind. And we've also noticed that maybe they've been posting some angry things online, some things that, that are kind of out of character for them. And we've heard rumors uh, from others that things aren't really going all that well at home. And yet, for some reason, instead of reaching out, instead of just instead of sending somebody a note, we choose to leave them alone on an island by themselves. Friends, faith is not supposed to be private like this. This is wrong on so many levels, to let, to let somebody just struggle in their faith. See, God has wired us up to, to need care, but He's also wired us up to give care. To, to be able to, to simply ask somebody, how's it going? How can I be praying for you? Again, this, isn't, this doesn't have to be a, a super deep friendship, but to simply care for another brother or sister in Christ, to say, how can I pray for you? It seems like you're going through a hard time. Or to drop somebody a note and say, hey, are, are things going all right? I haven't seen you at church for a while. To notice people. See, one of the best ways to demonstrate storge to another believer is to care about their relationship with God. And I believe this is this to be the purest way for us to show care for each other. To hold each other in high regard. To honor each other. That we would care enough to ask about their relationship with Jesus. To ask how their time is in the Word. To ask about their prayer life. To know their spiritual gifts. To encourage their faith. To encourage their godliness in their marriage, in their job, and in their parenting. To care enough about a brother or sister, that we, would, that we would try and restore them back to faith. It's a huge win for the kingdom. James 5 uh, talks specifically about bringing a brother or sister back to faith. James 5, 19 through 20 says, My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. It's a lie of the devil that gets us to believe that our faith is private, that it's meant to be lived out in a solitary manner. God desires that we would care about each other, that we would care for each other, that we would demonstrate that in the simple acts of affection toward one another, that we would have a high regard for one another, that we would have a genuine care especially if someone is struggling in their faith. That we would care enough to draw him or her back to church, back to community, back to fellowship with others, back to fellowship with God. I cannot think of a more critical time than now that we would care about each other, that we would be looking out for one another, that we would be doing whatever we can to make sure that people are staying on track, to make sure that, that people are... are understand that there are people out there who care about them. Let's start by reaching out. Let's get connected. Let, let's be the kind of community that cares deeply about the spiritual development of our brothers and sisters in Christ, simply because they're a believer. We don't have to have a, a deep friendship. We, our connection it is through Jesus, and we can care about each other because of this common bond we have. And as we gather together, whether it's in person or online, we have a way of connecting with each other, making sure that people are around, making sure that people are, are being prayer, prayed for, because we are all wired up to, to receive care and to give care in our life. One of the best ways for us to demonstrate storge to another believer is to care about their relationship with God. Who in your life do you have a genuine regard for? See, faith is not meant to be lived privately. God desires that we would care for each other. And this is especially true when it comes to encouraging your relation, our relationship with God. Your next move 
is to prayerfully take inventory of who's in your life. Who are you investing into? And what people are investing into your life? Who's encouraging you to be more like Jesus? And then ask someone today, how's your walk going with God? How can I be praying for you? Let's demonstrate a very basic level of care for each other as we hold each other in high regard. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the many levels of love that you've created for us to experience, Lord. And at this very basic level, may as, as a church, may we, be, may we become the kind of community that cares deeply about each other, that cares about one another's faith, that we would, we would care enough to ask the simple questions, how are you doing? How's your walk with God? How's your time in the Word? How can I be praying for you? Lord, we thank you for the, the, the magnificent and mysterious way you've wired us up, Lord. And we, we give you glory, uh, Lord, that we don't have to do this life alone. It's in your son's name that we pray these things, Father. Amen. Well, my benediction for you comes out of Ephesians 6. May grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. I want to thank you for joining us online. If you came ready with your gifts and offering, I want to remind you that we still have our joy box. You can always mail a check into the church or you can go online and give through our online giving portal. I want to thank you for joining us. God bless. Have a wonderful week. Every day we go through the simple routine of getting dressed in the morning, taking a shower, brushing our teeth, Yet we give very little consideration to what life would be like if we did not have access to basic hygiene items. There are people in our community struggling and we can make a difference. We are partnering with our local radio station, The Family, and their annual Help for the Homeless Hygiene Drive. Throughout this month, as you have opportunity, pick up a few extra hygiene items to serve those in need. Items can be dropped off at the donation box in the church lobby on Sundays before noon and Monday through Thursday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Let's be the church. Throughout February, February, (laughs) through throughout February, (laughs) you can't do it. And she can't do it. (laughs) Items can be dropped off at the donation box. (laughs) I want to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed week. And I don't know what to do with my hands anymore, Joe. I don't know. Cut that together somehow. (laughs) I don't care who you are. That's funny. (laughs) 